We should be live here in a second. Here we go. It looks like it's uh, streaming live. Yep, I think we are almost there. Okay, I think we are live. Okay, um, I think we are live. I apologize for the delay that was on, that was on me as it were. Um, so, we are joined here today. We are live on Facebook, I believe. Um, we are joined here today by Professor Anna Foka. Um, well, let me make sure this is, yep, it's play up right now. Um, we're joined here today by Professor Anna Foka, um, who, full disclosure, is a dear friend of mine, um, a dear personal friend of mine, um, and the mother of my goddaughter, in fact. Um, Professor Foka is um, among 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 Dean Michael Bara, um, is the manager the, and the scientific lead of the Digital Humanities Initiative at the Department of Archives, Museums, and Libraries at Uppsala University in Sweden. And for those of you who don't know, I'm allowed to brag and say that's the Oxford or Harvard of Sweden. Just say. <laughs> Um, she is also associate where she is also associate professor of information technology and the humanities. Um, she has all the math. Anna has the most interesting background of anyone I know. Um, she has a master's degree in classics, ancient history, and archaeology from Liverpool University, a PhD in classics and ancient history from, from Liverpool as well. Um, she also has a bachelor's degree in media and performance studies and a proficiency in pre-classical music, which I just learned today. Um, Professor Foka, and I'm gonna call her Anna, I can't help it, she's my real life friend. Um, Professor Foka um, is joining us today to talk about how digitization is changing the study of ancient history. And this is something that's near and dear to us at the National Hellenic Museum. Um, because we're really embarking on a digital path. And that's really a path we've been on for several years. Um, but it's really the way we see moving forward. And certainly through this crisis, um, cultural heritage institutions around the world are finding out the value of the digital in the work that we do. So it is my, my extreme pleasure um, to introduce um, Professor Foka to you and to let her talk to us a little bit about her incredible work, her incredibly, um, her, her really incredible and cutting edge work. Um, and of course, if you have questions, leave them in our um, comment section and I will, um, I will be the voice of the chorus, like an ancient tragedy, the voice of the people, and ask, um, ask Anna those questions at the end. Well, I, I should say I'm very honored so to Anna, be part of this. All yours. Um, I should say I'm very, I'm very, very honored to be part of this. Thank you so much, Katie, for inviting me. And thank you to the National Hellenic Museum of Chicago that I was actually planning to visit this summer. Um, but due to coronavirus, I'm not sure I can actually do it anymore. Um, I'm really grateful to be part of this. And uh, I will today, as Katie said, I'm an associate professor in information technology and humanities. Um, and my talk today is actually entitled Digital Perigesis. For those of you who don't know what Perigesis is, it, it refers to the uh, description of Greece, which is a 10 book uh, description of the geographical space of Greece in the auspices of the Roman Empire that was made in, and written in the second century CE by uh, a certain Posanias of Magnesia. Um, so today we will talk a little bit about how, what we're doing within this project, uh, the Digital Perigesis project. So uh, just to give you a summary of the talk, uh, 
it's uh, first I contextualize the project within the emerging discipline of spatial humanities. Uh, then I focus on our methods, infrastructure, affordances and challenges in the process of creating a digitally enriched edition of the books. And finally, I conclude with our future work in the project. So basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to take this book and turn it into a geographic information system, creating a digital cartography of all the places that Posanias has been through. And that's quite a challenging endeavor, but we have a, quite an interesting team. Uh, first of all, I should thank our funders, which is the Valley Bay Foundations um, that generously fund this project up until the beginning of 2022. Uh, our partners, which is the Austrian Institute of Technology, UMO University, Humla, but UMO University, the Open University, the Swedish Institutes in Athens, and the Pelagios Network of Partners, which is an infrastructure for digital classics. Um, we are very grateful to, to have the opportunity to work on Posanias. And uh, here, as you can see, I, I hope you can see my screen. You can see on the right hand side all the yeah, members I, of our I, team. I can see. We can have you can see all the members of our team. It's uh, it's me, it's Elton Barker, uh, who is a, a reader at oh, in classical studies and a digital classicist of the first order, so to say, uh, the community director of the Pelagios Network of Partners, uh, Cenk Demiroglu, who is a cultural geographer from Umo University. Kiriaki Kostandinidou, who's a classical philologist, uh, who is now placed in Thessaloniki, but works as a, a senior uh, researcher at Humla Binumo University. Nasrin Mostofian, who's working through Uppsala, she's a computational linguist. Uh, Rainer Simon, who is our technical person in the group, one of our technical persons, and who is a professor at the Austrian Institute of Technology and the creator of our platform, Recogito, where we annotate our text and enrich it with information. Linda Talatas, uh, who's an affiliate researcher at the Norwegian Institute in Athens, and Brady Kisling, that some of Greek Americans might know of. Uh, Brady is a diplomat and a historian, and he used to be the ambassador of the United States uh, in Greece uh, during the 90s. And he's also the creator and founder of Topos Text, which is a, an Ekaterini a Laskaridis Foundation initiative. And, it, and we can talk, we will talk about it um, uh, in a little bit further in this talk. So basically we're combining several different uh, disciplines here, such as classics, archeology, span cultural geography and geographic information systems, computational linguistics and computer science in this project. Uh, but let's get to discuss what actually the description of Greece, Perigisis Elados is actually, it's, so, so it's a tourist guide, actually. So you could think of it a little bit as the sort of trip advisor of the second century CE. Romans wanted to visit uh, Greece. They wanted to go and see the temples. Greece at the time was in the auspices of the Roman Empire. It was colonized. Um, and it sort of what, what Posanias did is he wrote 10 books in which he describes the landscapes. Um, and in a way, the way he describes it is a little bit what I call a Greek granddad. So instead of actually talking only about space, he talks about Greeks and he talks about others implicated in the history of Greece. He talks about places, he talks about monuments, then he turns back and talks about objects, people associated with place and stories. And as one of my favorite authors ever says, um, space becomes place because of the people who live in it, right? So he, it's not about topography per se, it's about the narrative, as he says, his narrative has picked out material things that deserve to be recorded. And in that way, he is what we would call perhaps, I call him a proto-heritage scholar. Uh, modern historians and contemporary historians and early modern historians claim that heritage is something that was created with modernity, but that's actually a lie because when Posanias talks about Greek space, talks about Greek monuments, talks about Greek um, 
religious temples he talks he goes he travels through time so he, he he doesn't just talk about the second century ce but he talks about the glorious classical past when greece was not colonized he talks about the romans when a lot of scholars are actually very unsure is he friendly to the romans or does he not like the romans what's the situation there also he very famously leaves out places like crete for example sorry katie i know your family comes from there but yeah um, it's it's quite an interesting narrative. So, and also it's 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 ten books that feature Hellenic identity in the Mediterranean, often pitted against the Roman colonizers or others. For example, the Egyptians, the Persians, even the mythical Hyperboreans. And unlike contemporary touristic guides, for example, TripAdvisor today, Posanias doesn't really care about describing nature. He he takes it as like for granted. Uh, his, instead, his narrative reveals a selective description of Greece based on its human footprint. So, so he actually begins his description with no introduction, but however he mentions halfway through the first book what seems to be his working method, such in my opinion are the, are the most famous legends and sites among the Athenians, and from the beginning my narrative has picked out much material things that deserve to be recorded. So he has a selective approach. That's why we call him the Greek granddad. It's like, okay, forget about this. Let's talk about that instead. Um, so why is space so important? I mean, in these days with coronavirus, I'm sure all of you have seen uh, graphs and, and maps and, and tragedy and uh, how many people are critically ill and all sorts of things. Well, the reality is that a growing number of literary scholars have also advocated using spatial analysis alongside traditional methods of close reading. So ancient geography is actually a, a very, very popular topic. In 2000, the Barrington Atlas became a modern GIS system covering ancient Mediterranean geography. The Hestia project that you can see here, um, whose PI was, is Elton Barker, focuses on live experiences in space and Topos text, who is like the creation of Brady Kiesling, and we're very honored to have these people on our on board with Posanias, has made available georeferences at an urban level. Gazetteers, such as the Digital Atlas of the Roman Empire and Pleiades, um, also um, gazette, by gazetteers, just to sort of avoid jargon there, a gazetteer is a structured vocabulary of spatial information. Uh, that machines can pick. So it's not just that we can look at the map, it's that we have a georeference that we can then connect to other references. So gazetteers as such are widely used by researchers. So a space is not anymore a toponym. So we can't just say Rome or Athens or Macedonia or whatever. As Chiara Palladino notes, the semantic concept of space can be sea, can be an island, can be a lake. Other words too have semantic importance besides their geographical locations. They represent concepts of trade, power, and culture. So how do we work with this? So how do we mark and ascribe metadata? So to how do we enrich our book with geographical information? Um, as you can see, you can see a map, a map depicting locations described in Posanias uh, by J.G. Fraser that was found in the British Library. Um, how can we actually do this with the text? Well, first of all, we use uh, the text of the Perigisis from the Perseus Classical Library. So what kind of technologies do we use are already out there? So we have a, a text in Greek that we have uploaded. And because it's a sort of open license, um, by CCBY and for free reuse. We do not violate in Europe any GDPR regulations as text, our texts are out of copyright domain. So we treat that text as a spatial archive. We align a word for place to an appropriate georeference. And how do we do that? We don't have to do this manually. So we don't just take a word out. We partner with Pelagios, that is a platform for geospatial research as well as the web-based tool Recogito that you can see there. And we reuse and extend data and tools that already have a community around them. So instead of sort of like reinventing everything, we use a semantic annotation platform. So how does it work? Using a network of global authorities of place information, 
Recogito, our platform, enables the user to identify a character string. So for example, we pick the word Athens in the text as a place, but then we align that reference to an appropriate gazetteer. So one can disambiguate between the Athens of Posanias period and Athens, Georgia, the hometown of the band R.E.M. The method of annotation is twofold. Locate the places in your online document and then create an annotation. Align or resolve these annotations to a digital authority, a georeference that provides the means to identify and disambiguate between different places. So online gazetteers also provide what are called uniform resource identifiers. These are sort of numbers that refer to place and geographical references. It's not just uh, the coordinates, but these are numbers like a social security number of sorts that helps disambiguate places of the same name or identify the same place with different names or typography. Um, so, so what we do is having uploaded our different versions of Posanias 10 books to our local Umeo University instance, we essentially treat the text itself as a database of spatial information and we work with a number of sort of place name vocabularies. So the digital atlas of the Roman empire that is now in Gothenburg, the Pleiades, uh, the Topos text uh, that Brady Kisling has kindly provided us with and the Judith Binders ad history gazetteer that contains all of the historical places we're talking about. Uh, at the moment, Pleiades is the most complete gazetteer that we have. So what have we, we've been doing so far? So the primary concept of annotation is to identify a place in the text. So a region, a city, a temple, a river fountain and market it and align it to an appropriate gazetteer place entry that includes actual geographic coordinates. Yet many of these spaces are related to and connected through people acting as agents. Thus by using a second choice of entity people all the agents acting are identified within specific spaces, capturing also their movement. So from 2018 to 2019, we developed a method of sort of sorting out text and categorizing information and extracting complex spatial data. And we have worked on three case studies which provide different perspectives on the pro process. So during 2019 to 2020 and starting from this month, uh, we systematically aim at annotating all books and we concentrate on space, not simply as toponyms, but also people as proxies. So how many times, for example, do we find the Athenians being in uh, Sparta or in Rome and so on? And we're still working through it, but I'm going to show you some of our early case studies here because I have them available. So annotating the text and being able to visualize it gives us the ability to contemplate on information of Greek space over the centuries and Hellenic identity and to process it more closely in a scholar, scholarly critical manner. So for example, annotating all toponyms from old books, one can clearly see in our picture, this is a, a, a map we actually produced, that the categorization of books into regional chunks you can see in this picture is a later construct. So actually we know, as you can see in the extra picture here, that these are all the regions described in the books, right? So for many, many years, a lot of philologists say, well, Crete has been left out or Cyprus has been left out. But actually, when we annotate, we see that Crete is part of, of Posanias narrative. It's just that later categorization did not include it. So by annotating all toponyms, we see sort of fragments of Hellenic identity all over the Mediterranean and not just what we consider the titles of the books. This is the title of the books as we know it. And this is our toponyms. I think you can see the difference, right? So for years we thought, okay, well, he speaks only about mainland Greece. Well, yeah, but he implicates the rest of the Mediterranean too. Very interesting stuff. Sometimes we have to sit and think, okay, what Megara does he refer to? Is it the place in Southern Italy or is it like our Megara in Attica? It's quite complicated. And we have to think through every annotation to align every word with the appropriate georeference. Um, another thing is that we are trying to do what we call, what Franco Moretti calls close reading. So we are now incorporating more granular information about key sites, precisely Athens and Corinth 
specifically to analyze better urban space and its people, ingesting new material into existing gazetteers, or at any rate linking the, the digital atlas and player disinformation to other providers like Topos Text. There are challenges in developing intra-city gazetteers because Chris has changed so much and there's a lot of sort of archaeological information that doesn't fit the narrative. Uh, but zooming into urban environments is a worthy enterprise in the light of microhistory, right? So we find it as a very interesting thing to do, sort of let's boil it down and see what happens in Attica and Kerameikos. Um, interoperability. So what we're trying to do further is we're trying to connect other objects uh, to what we're trying to do to our big map, so to say. And we're further seeing how culture and identity plays at the spatio-temporal concept. In Posanias, historical places, more or less, as Maria Pretzler would put it, are possible to track, but the time parameter is very often unclear because as, as a classic Greek granddad, uh, Papus, <laughs> Posanias is not entire. He, he talks about a mythical time. Here is a time when Artemis went from the Hyperboreans to Delos, blah, blah. And then he switches to in the, in the time of the reign of Mithridates. And, and then, you know, you don't know exactly. So space is not just space, but it's also temporal, temporal analysis, temporal data. Uh, so we see in a way, the space in Posanias and historical space is what uh, Mikhail Bakhtin calls the chronotope. It's a conjunction of space and time. And that's very difficult because we don't have the language, although GIS uh, is geographic information systems are very well advanced with digital technology, we still don't have the appropriate gazetteers for time. So um, one idea at the moment is to use the periodotemporal gazetteer or perhaps Trismegistos to disambiguate the different time periods Posania speaks about. On the other hand, Pleiades georeferences offer include the time period. Right, so we have, for example, three types of Achaia, right? We have early Achaia, we have Achaia province, and we have late antiquity Achaia. They're not that different, but there are some few differences between those. So it's also while we structure space, we are also simultaneously trying to structure time. Uh, by the way, if my family comes back and ruins this lecture, it's not my fault. I'm just letting you know I have a five and a half year old daughter. I think they're about to come back soon. Um, so, so far, just to uh, conclude, when it comes to visualization possibilities, uh, together with our cultural geography, we have been testing our current data on DILOS, so we can compare different forms of spatial rendering of our extracted data. For example, importing all our data into ArcGIS, we have a 3D terrain um, to navigate. We can also stretch archaeological maps. Here you see the Delos, uh, map of Delos from the French School of Athens. They have been majorly doing most of the excavations there, and they have a lot of uh, geographic material to share. And we can visualize our data in a contemporary mapping environment. So we're now envisioning network visualizations with Gephi and NodeGoat, which are two other platforms. We can further visualize movement as relations if we simply annotate relations with a simple ontology such as origin and destination and movement flows. And for this, we're using the visualization platform Palladio. But with these are still sort of testings to see what we can come up with. Um, to conclude, so far, the very process of annotating is in effect a collaborative deep reading of a complex text. The transformation of text into data into maps facilitates a visual analysis that so far has helped us comprehend the density of the text in communicating the complexity of ancient identities. I mean, we're talking about time when there's war, there is pandemics, there is colonization. So it's quite relevant to us today to see how space plays out with this. Now, actually, one of our team members is annotating the words for loimos and nosos, which both mean sickness in the text, because she's very inspired. She's stuck, she's stuck in Athens. And uh, she <laughs> in lockdown. So she says, OK, let's see how many pandemics we can find out in Posanias. That's um, brilliant. I know, right? It's, it's Linda that has been thinking, oh, I found Nosos here. I found Loimos. So I think it's really interesting and also quite interesting because we see that the world of our times is not so different than the world of that time. And really, as a, as a species, we haven't advanced that much. 
Um, and that's, uh, yeah, it's quite interesting. It's like the 1920s, only with worse music. I think, <laughs> Katie, you've said that before, and I keep on referring to you in that. So, but we have a and social, not- but with annotating, we, we have a social deep reading and we enable also collaboration so we can have different disciplines talking to each other. And we're all working with remote technologies. So we don't actually physically meet more than once a year because we think it's bad for the environment. So what we do is we use technology to annotate, we use collaborative annotations through Recogito, and then we have meetings and when we discuss uh, what to do next. And we're hoping to come up with a very interesting geographic information system for Pausanias. Um, and visual analysis, we think it's a very powerful tool. So I, all, all my relatives from Northern Italy and, and Greece that call me and ask me, oh my God, what's going on in Sweden? You have no lockdowns, guys. We look at all the GIS, you know, we look at all the maps. Then we know that visual analysis is a very powerful tool. You don't have to read huge bits of text to understand what's going on. You can just see an image and you instantly understand because modern contemporary humans have a bird's eye view of the world that previous people didn't and if uh, at some other occasion i will show you some interesting maps from the ancient world and they are not really like as we would consider them today because technology has helped us see the world in different eyes and cartography means so many other different things these days visually so by connecting disparate data we hope to diversify hellenic space and we hope to um sort of diversified dated notions of historical space. So Greece at the time was not a nation state. It was under the auspices of the Roman empire. It was colonized. However, there was Greeks and Hellenic identity all around the area and all around the Mediterranean. And that's what we want to show uh, as it is Greeks all over the world today, right? And actually, um... I, 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 I'm afraid no one gets to clap for you in this, um, in this venue, but I would clap for you. Yeah, you, you can see, you and, can see um, some more. Yeah. I, I'm actually wondering if I can ask the first question. Oh, no, go ahead, sorry. No, I just wanted to say uh, some further reading. I've got some publications out. We've got some publications out already. Uh, so if you are interested in, in reading, uh, you can have a look at those. And, and um, you can you can kindly contact the PI, which is me, and uh, also tweet us if you have any questions or write us, and we would be very happy to collaborate, especially with the National Hellenic Museum of Chicago. <laughs> there we go. I, I I I can't imagine us not working together in the future, because um, like I said, we're, we're we're working on a kit together, right? Um, Exactly. <laughs> so, um, actually, if you don't mind it, and the first, I'm gonna, sh- I'll share those, um, I'll share those citations, those readings on our social media, um, so that if people are interested, they can look that up. They can look up those that reading. Um, and also, I wanted, um, especially at the, at the museum, one of the, the first, I want to ask the first question because I'm in charge. Um, I'm the master of this. Um, you know, at the museum, one of the things as you were talking that I was thinking about is how important movement has been to the history of the Greek people. And um, at the museum, as a museum founded by diasporatic Greeks, I'm really focused on the history of the Greek diaspora. Um, you know, the journey of the Greek people from, from ancient history to, to, the, to the modern period um, is something that's really important to us. So I was wondering if you could comment on the ways that this kind of um, this kind of research, this kind of mapping, this kind of sharing of information um, might be particularly helpful um, for scholars and institutions dedicated to the study of, of Greek history, of Hellenic history more broadly. The movement, you mean? Yeah, the movement. Like, so ma- how is mapping sort of, I think, I guess, unique um, to the sort of, to help, how, is, how can it be helpful, ways in which it can be helpful? Um, I think studying movement is very interesting because uh, at least Europeans, I I can talk about Europe uh, and I can talk about the relationship of Europe to the rest of the world. Um, We we tend to forget that that nation states is a new thing in Europe. Uh, Greece Greece became a nation, an independent nation in 1821. 
Uh, however, there were Greeks, of course. Yeah, <laughs> not, Some of not long ago, right? Under the Roman Empire, uh, under the Ottoman Empire. Some others, like where I'm from, which is the Ionian Islands. I'm from Kefalonia. I'm actually very proud. As you know, I'm very proud of <laughs> being a Kefalonian. Um, um, yeah, I mean, Kefalonians were a completely different story. And, and it's quite interesting because I will, I will come up with a modern sort of concept that I found out, which was I found very interesting. Years ago, I was working in a project called Digital Models, which, which had to do with sort of the, the history of the Swedish industry and digitizing material archival collections that were donated to the National Museum of, of, um, of uh, Science and Technology in Stockholm. And I, I ended up in, in a small town in Norway for a conference, Stavanger, and then they took us to a conservation museum. And I found out that our national Kefalonian dish, which <laughs> is, which is uh, bacalaros, it's, a, it's, it's like cod that is salted. It's actually a Norwegian dish. Oh no. And, and I thought, what is going on? How is, it, how is this even possible? It's stockfish also, which is also a staple. So this is because we were part of the Venetian empire and because of the Venetian trade routes, we ended up like having those, those, exactly. So, so all around, all around the Adriatic, all around, <laughs> Mediterranean, <laughs> you find this dish and it's like, but it's Norwegian, it's important. And it's always been important, but we don't think about that, this as much. And I'm thinking that in a way, movement sort of, in, we, we, we see movement, we see diaspora as very often, and, and the same applies to Greeks. Um, we see diaspora as, as a product of conflict uh, and migration and transformation of social infrastructure. So, you know, Mithridates burns down the los to ashes and then moves out uh, and then destroys everything. And then there's no more Greeks in Delos for many years. That's, that's a lie. Um, that's not exactly the case. But what you do find in Delos, which Posanias doesn't speak about, is the world's first synagogue. Oh, that's fascinating. And, and you think, OK, but hang on a minute. And then you have the, the, symp the building of the symposiasts of Beirut also. Uh, which oh. was a, which was a which was a double cult site. So the the very very famous um, mini statue of Aphrodite with Pan, which is now the National Hellenic Museum in in uh, of Antiquities in Athens, um, was actually found in that sort of guild of the symposium of the Posidonians, and that's a place where there was a double cult uh, of Greek gods and. Uh, Near Eastern, Middle Eastern gods, if you like. Um, so you know they they sort of sacrificed together to Poseidon and Baal, uh, and there was a double cult of Venus and Astarte. So you you see these things and you think, okay, maybe it wasn't everything about conflict. Maybe there was it was also about the inherent humanity and connection and networking. Um, so not everything is is a is a is a product of conflict. Not all movement is a product of conflict or need. A lot of it is willingly. And I mean, and then this is sort of boils down to our personal stories, Kate, and how we've met. We've met, we both met, you are, you are a third generation Greek diaspora girl and I'm a reverse diaspora. My parents were migrants in Australia. And I ended up in, we both, we, oh, you obviously your, your second, your first language is English and my second language was English. And we both ended up to study classical studies in the UK. And now, now you're in Chicago, and I'm, I'm in in uh, Uppsala, and and this is just a tiny little story of movement that means so much. So yeah, I think looking at movement also in a positive light, it's interesting. It's not just migration, <laughs> colonization. No, I think. That's an important part of, of, the, of the sort of um, Greek, Greek story as it were. Well, I, I think, think it's quite technical. interesting because uh, the, Romans, the Romans had uh, itineraria. Ooh, have I lost you? Katie?
I think we've lost Katie. Hi, I think we've lost Katie. But anyways, um, I, what I'm trying to say here is that um, movement is so important to, to the Greeks, I think, as a, as a culture. Um, so what I wanted to say is that while we've been, uh, while we've, we Greeks have been, whereas we have like a Romanite in Araria, which is basically a map that lays out the infrastructure for Romans, the Greeks famously used periplus, which is navigation maps from island to island. And I think we tend to forget this, that uh, as, a, as a culture, we are travelers. And I think that's very important. Um, I think, I, I think, the system might be crashing. I'm not sure if Katie, Katie will come back. I think I should say goodbye now and thank you for your time. And we're very happy to answer questions in relation to the project or otherwise. And we're very happy to collaborate. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>